Okay, there are a few people coming in, but as soon as they are here, we're going to start. So welcome to this, this panel with this strange uh, title, Enhancing Europe's Economic Sovereignty. I don't think we could have had a panel like that, certainly two years ago not, last year perhaps. Uh, now it seems, you know, topical. Um, and that's an indication of the, the changes we, we're going through. Um, we uh, used to, to think uh, in, in, in silos. I mean, we had the, the economic silo and the sub-silos, trade, uh, finance, macro, etc. Uh, and we had the, the security foreign affair uh, one. And they were, they were completely separate. I mean, perhaps two different spheres. Um, and that's a, the basically the world we've, we've known you know, for, for decades, um, in which uh, we had a separate uh, conversation. And from time to time, there were some you know, connections, but there was no permanent connection between those two types of, of discussions. And uh, this is changing. This has changed. I mean, we're seeing more and more uh, connection between the security dimension, the foreign affair dimension, and the economic dimension. And that what prompted um, the idea of doing a paper jointly with the Bruegel and the um, uh, European Center for Foreign, uh, sorry? Council. Council for Foreign <laughs> Relations, <laughs> European Council for Foreign <laughs> Relations. Yes, obviously CFR, <laughs> ECFR. Uh, <coughs> that we started with, with Mark, and actually this session is co-organized with the, with the ECFR. Uh, to, to start having these discussions among, among scholars and uh, finding out uh, you know, where we would, uh, would take it and, uh, and uh, which proposal it could result uh, in. And that resulted in a paper on um, uh, redefining um, economic sovereignty, Europe's, and, and a memo, a short version, which is published in the memo um, volume, as uh, addressed to the high representative uh, but obviously with implication also for other portfolios. Uh, and we thought that it would be interesting to organize uh, a discussion around this theme. Um, so Mark will, will start, perhaps uh, giving the gist and some of the proposals in the paper. And then we'll, we'll organize the, the, um, the um, discussion with Maya Spiraki of the European Parliament, uh, EPP group. Selvin Veyant, the um, Director General uh, for, for Trade, and Pierre Hebron, the Vice President of the uh, EBRD. Um, I have suggested that in initial intervention should be short so that we can have you know, the main points, then organize the discussion among the panelists, and then open the, uh, to the floor. Thank you very much, Jean. Um, and before I start talking about what we, uh, some of the ideas that we've written in our joint paper, I just want to say how happy I am to be here today working with you and also what a complete joy the whole process has been because um, as you say, we have not just organized ourselves in silos, we've had very different ways of, of looking at the world through these different prisms and I've learned a huge amount through our engagement together and I think what came out of this is an attempt both intellectually to try and close the gap between the different areas but also to think about the world in, in a slightly different way, which is more of a hybrid <laughs> way of thinking about the world. And um, I suppose that's my starting point. The, the, the title of this session sounds a bit abstract. It's kind of slightly complicated. Um, and that's, I suppose, because sovereignty is a bit like oxygen. You don't really notice it when you have it. <laughs> but when it's gone, you really miss it. <laughs> and... <laughs> There was this moment uh, when um, the US withdrew from the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal in 2018, which was one of these asphyxiating moments when we really noticed that we had major constraints on our ability to pursue our goals in the world. Before that, I think there was an assumption in many capitals that if Europe didn't punch its weight in the world stage, it was mainly our own fault. <laughs> it's because we didn't agree with each other on different issues. But when we were agreed, 
and we put real resources behind it, typically we were able to, to, to do what we wanted and to, to shape the world. And this was a moment when we realized the limits of, of that way of looking at things. And it was a real shock because Europeans have, have based a lot of their thinking on the idea that we live in a multilateral rule-based order, that we have a firm alliance based not just on shared values, but also shared interests with the United States of America. And also a particular idea about how the, the world e economy would be organized with, with free and fair trade and globalization benefiting everybody. So that the role of the state was mainly to make sure that there was proper competition and that consumer interests were protected rather than getting overly involved in, in the industrial policy and production, et cetera. Um, and what we now realize is that the most important structural feature of our world isn't multilateralism, it's rather a a bipolar competition between China and America, our two most important economic partners. And as a result, the whole nature of globalization is changing. Because neither China nor America wants to envisage a conventional war against each other, what they have realized is that their most powerful weapons are to manipulate the architecture of globalization. So both in the US and China, there is an increasing merging of geoeconomics and geopolitics. And we can see that the US is politicizing a lot of things that we thought of as global public goods. The, the US financial system, SWIFT, the WTO, the internet, the IMF, all of these things have been redefined as instruments of American power and American foreign policy. And at the same time, as China has become more and more part of our lives, we're realizing that they do things very differently there and that there is more of a mingling of politics, of foreign policy and of economics. And we can see that whether it's in the choice of, of, of strategic investments, whether it's the way that state aid gets used, or whether it's the way that the EU's ability to shape multilateral institutions or our place in third parties gets affected. And the net result is that interdependence, which we thought of as a big barrier to, to global conflict, is increasingly becoming a battleground and it's being weaponized in lots of different ways. And that was a sort of backdrop to the work that we did. As I said, the idea of, of sovereignty does sound kind of abstract, but its um, absence uh, is being felt now on Iran. But what would happen if, if the US adopted a similar approach to trade with China or with Russia? And we know how much that would cost. It would cost a billion euros a day if they did what they did on, uh, towards China, to, 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 towards Iran. And the work we, we did with, with Bruegel was basically trying to see how we can adapt the EU to this new world. And it's largely about thinking about how we can get out of our silos and, and create a better linkage between those two areas. And the proposals sort of go through three main areas. First, there's a sort of intellectual barrier. Secondly, there are questions about what capacity we need to, to build in order to function in this world. And then thirdly, there are questions about how we organize ourselves institutionally. I think the intellectual side is, is really about um, changing the mindset amongst policymakers to, under, to think as a geopolitical power, to define our goals and then to act strategically. There might be some areas where we want to limit our dependence on others or to make it less one-sided, but the basic philosophy which we adopted in this paper is that in most areas, autonomy is not possible nor desirable, and that our goal is really to see how um, we can decide for ourselves how we want to act and then to make sure that we're able to deter others from instrumentalizing and weaponizing the global system by being able to respond um, to any escalation in those areas, but with a goal of trying to keep an open system free. And that's what we call economic sovereignty or, or strategic sovereignty in the paper. The second sort of area is, is to think about what capacities you need to do uh, to build it in order to deal with specific vulnerabilities. And there are lots of very, very concrete ideas in, in, the, in the paper. We outlined an agenda that includes expanding control of state aid beyond the EU, looking at how you can deal with third parties, defining uh, procedures to take um, uh, security concerns into account um, when it comes to, to, to competition decisions. We talked about the high representative being given a right to invoke a, a security clause if very specific conditions are, um, uh, are fulfilled um, and to, to uh, 
we, we talked about the, the idea of developing a common approach to screening foreign investments. There's a whole series on the long journey we need to take to have a, a bigger international role for the euro, looking at some of the foundations for that, whether it's deep and integrated capital and banking markets, a, a euro area safe asset or, or euro swap lines. The fifth area of, of, of recommendations is to think about um, how to prepare for the possibility of a politically motivated stalemate over IMF assistance to, to neighboring countries. That could either be done through giving a role to the ESM or, or strengthening um, EU budget funded balance of payments instruments available to third countries. Um, the sixth area is, is to think about sanctions um, and how we deal with, with unilateral sanctions. There are lots of specific ideas on that, but our basic idea is that there's a limit to how far we're going to get with things like instex and attempts to 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 um, to, to funnel things round the the, the dollar-based world, and that the most fruitful thing is to come up with appropriate and proportionate economic retaliation measures, which have worked well in trade, and which we need to now think about in in, in uh, to deal with sanctions. And finally, there is a whole set of ideas about. The, uh, the EU leverage over multilateral institutions and how we organize ourselves there. But if we are going to do that, we're also going to have to come to terms with the institutional barriers to common action. Henri Sapir, who's in the front row, did a very good paper a few years ago on Europe as a fragmented power. And I think that is the, the biggest uh, problem for us, that, which explains the gap between our theoretical power in the world and our ability to actually turn our preferences into policy decisions. And in the paper, we look at some ways of doing that, both by creating a, an economic sovereignty commission, committee within the European Commission, which can look at how you could bring these different portfolios together, um, and also ways of, of uh, beefing up the the, the EAS so that it has more power for economic statecraft and the idea of setting up a, a European Sanctions Bureau. Um, but I think underlying all of those things will be a, a also some, some big questions about political will and how we can persuade member states that unless they see common European action as the first line of defense in this dangerous geo-economic world, um, they will find their sovereignty shrinking more and more in different areas. And I think that is really what I'd like to end with, the fact that this is a different way of thinking about sovereignty for Europeans, which makes the conversation quite uncomfortable. For most of the last few decades, our goal has been about taming sovereignty because that was the biggest problem that we had within Europe, and most of the problems came from within Europe. And our goal now is about reclaiming sovereignty, not <laughs> from uh, each other or from national states, but from China from Russia, from the United States, from Google, from Apple. Um, and in that sense, in some ways, it's about going back to the roots of the European project, but in a different way, to see how Europe can rescue national sovereignty. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you. you as, as you perfectly outlined, I mean, there are different levels at which we can have this discussion. One is the, the diagnosis um, and the, the sort of overall concept uh, of the discussion. Another one is that of the various proposals we make in the paper, uh, which you know, cover a relatively large uh, range of issues. And the third one is the machinery and the, the way uh, I mean the, the, the governance uh, can be organized. Now, if I go back to the first, you use a very strong expression saying you know, that uh, the rivalry between China and the US is more about uh, weaponizing the architecture of globalization than about you know, having a real confrontation through the traditional you know, means of uh, <laughs> state confrontation. Um, and that's, uh, that's really the core of the issue we want to discuss, right? Uh, and I think that's particularly <laughs> good that you're able to give us all your, your reaction because trade is typically this kind of field where you had rules of the game uh, and you know, by and large countries abided by, by the rules of the game and, and suddenly it looks different. So. I'm particularly interested in your reaction. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this panel. And um, it may sound like pandering, but I still have to start by saying that I took up my job in June this year, and one of the first think pieces that landed on my desk was the paper that Mark just quickly presented. And I was very intrigued by it because I thought that it... Uh, uh, 
this juxtaposition between geoeconomics and geopolitics uh, coming to an end, uh, and that this poses a particular problem for the EU, which has been founded on the separation between the political and economic sphere, is something which really captured a lot that uh, I felt as I was working my way uh, through the different files. However, I do have my problems with the notion of uh, economic sovereignty, because it can mean very different things to very different people. Now, the way I understand it and where it makes sense for me is indeed where you started, Mark, by saying it's about the unraveling of the multilateral order as we know it. In trade, it is particularly visible, uh, but you mentioned other areas, and that is quite, quite clear. And what this means for Europe's economic sovereignty is that we are under increasing pressure to choose our camp between the US and China between following US unilateralism um, or uh, following China uh, and come to terms with its uh, state-led economic model and all the distortions that that uh, entails uh, on global markets, including for the EU. And I think my definition of economic sovereignty is Europe has to be able to hold its own in this battle and not have to choose. We must be able to defend our economic and our societal model against two competing visions of the world, uh, neither of which really correspond to, to what we look at. So that is, the, um, that is the, the, an understanding of economic sovereignty I can, I can work with. But if you see how the notion of sovereignty gets more and more mixed up with notions of nationalism, economic or political, the risk with the notion of, economic, of, of European uh, economic sovereignty is that you simply transpose uh, the inward-looking nature and the unilateralism associated with nationalism onto the European stage. And I think that would be disastrous. And uh, if you look at some ideas, you can see that this is not an abstract risk, that there are certain considerations that go into that direction. And here I think it is very important for us that as EU we keep the trademark of openness and cooperation uh, to manage the world as we see it around us. Four quick points on the, on the paper. On the diagnostic, um, I had noted down the same expression, trade and investment is being weaponized at the moment uh, uh, um, and in, in, in the conflict between the US and China that we see. Uh, and it is the interface between trade, technology, uh, uh, data, and security which makes the governance so complicated. The system of the WTO is not set up to deal with the interactions between all these areas. Uh, and we have to find a way that uh, we do not just have a blanket security exception that is self-declaratory, and then you can do whatever you want by saying it, this affects my national security, but at the same time, we have to preserve policy space to cater for different collective preferences. We do not have the same approach to data privacy, neither with the US nor with China. We do not have the same uh, 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 approach to uh, uh, technology issues across the board. So this is the challenge we have. And uh, um, the second uh, uh, element of diagnostic is the US-China confrontation while weaponizing trade is about much more than tariff issues. Uh, it is a much more fundamental challenge to the primacy of international economic law. We see that uh, with uh, the US unilateral measures, but we also see it with China, which is challenging the current system with its own state-led economic model but also with an alternative approach to standard setting and standard export. What normally is that what we do in the WTO multilaterally or through regional trade agreements, um, which is you develop rules for trade, etc. China is doing that through the Belt and Road Initiative and in a totally different manner with a lack of transparency, with not the same possibility for access to everyone without consideration for sustainable development that poses totally different challenges uh, than what we are used to, to dealing with. So, second point I wanted to make is what are the vectors of action that we have? I think the priority has to be shoring up the multilateral system across trade, but also finance, but I will not venture into that. I leave that to Pierre. Um, 
to avoid a return to, a pow to power based uh, international relations. And here the key test for the EU in trade will be our ability to withstand the pressure to accept managed trade, uh, 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 which would fly in the face of the trading system we've been building for decades and which has served us well. This, uh, the second vector is that we continue using our FTAs as building blocks for global governance. If you look at the FTAs, yes, the market access elements are important. They're important for the competitiveness of, of, of EU business and of the business of our partners. But the actually really interesting bit is that through the FTAs, we are also shoring up the multilateral system because the rules agenda, the cooperation platforms that we create on issues ranging from labor rights to climate change, uh, um, they are much more important, especially at a moment when the multilateral system on its own is under threat. And obviously the third element, uh, the third vector is that we need to strengthen our internal resilience and to stand up for our rights and be assertive in the defense of our rights. I think we have already stepped up our action on trade defense instruments, for instance, in order to counter uh, 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 distortive practices. <laughs> we have the investment screening instrument, which is uh, a soft start, uh, but at least it's there. A few years ago that wasn't possible, so we now have to make sure that it is up and running and actually uh, uh, delivers. We are still waiting for approval of the uh, reciprocity instrument in uh, public procurement, the international procurement instrument. Um, but we also need to strengthen our uh, autonomous uh, ability to act on export control of sensitive technology. So there are lots of things that the incoming uh, commission will have to look at. Third point I wanted to make is we need to have some realism uh, with respect to our strengths and uh, weaknesses. Um, I don't think that beyond trade and competition there will be lots of policy areas that will be uh, federalized in the next uh, five years. Um, but I think we should not underestimate our ability to act in a more joined up manner within the current setup. If there is the political will, then you can, you can move forward. And I think the combination of the challenge that we have with uh, uh, the US and China in particular has reinforced the realization amongst the member states that they have an enormous amount of shared interests and if they want to not have to choose between the US and China, Europe is the only protection they have for that and it's the relevant uh, uh, level uh, to act. Um, there is a tendency in some member states, but also particularly, I think, in the Brussels Beltway, to immediately go to institutional issues. I think that would be the worst thing to do, given the challenge, the immediate challenge we face, we should not go into a period of navel-gazing and institutional discussions, which would be a distraction from dealing with the actual problems we have. Um, the fourth point I wanted to make is that, like charity, economic sovereignty starts at home. Um, and that means that we have to have a lot of focus. I mean, you've been focusing, because you also wrote a memo to the high rep and MVP, uh, you've been focusing very much on the consistency of the external action instruments. I think for the ability, for the Europe's economic sovereignty, the way I, I understand it, it is much more important that we integrate the internal policies and the external policies. Because if we are taken seriously globally, if the American, the US president sits down with the president of the European Commission, it's because we have the internal market of 500, 500 million people. And that gives us the weight and the strength to stand up to other powers. Uh, and I think this integration between uh, internal and external policies, uh, trade policy more as, or in general I would say, external economic policy as a projection of the single market, that is something where we have progress to make. <coughs> Uh, and I hope that that uh, will be high on the agenda of the incoming commission. That is certainly what we are preparing. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, and surprisingly, you started by telling us that there could be bad news mm -hmm. of, of, of sovereignty. And 
And obviously, it opens the door to many temptations we should resist. Um, so so we, may, we may wish to go back to, to it uh, because that's it's certainly part of the discussion. But for, for, for the rest, I take from what you, you're saying, you know, with the note of caution on the, on the governance and the institutional um, temptation, that uh, that's your, you know, part of what you're saying at least is, is, is something you share. Maya. It's open. Okay. Well, thank you very much once again for the invitation to this high-level panel. I am a politician. I am elected from Greece. It is my second mandate, and I would like to start as a politician. Well, there is something like uh, misconception concerning sovereignty. And it is something that it we have to, to explain, first of all, to our voters, to our citizens. Starting with the misconception of economic sovereignty being a trade-off of the membership of the European Union is a false belief. And uh, based on this, I would like just to, to, to share with you some kind of, uh, of uh, arguments that uh, Mario Draghi has already published by, by last February. Draghi said that uh, this kind of uh, misconception based on the confusion that we have with <coughs> independence. And a lot of people are confusing independence with sovereignty. And uh, he said that true sovereignty is reflected not in the power of making laws, but in the ability to control outcomes and respond to the fundamental needs of the people. The ability to make independent decisions does not guarantee countries such control. In other words, independence does not guarantee sovereignty. This is, I think, s the first lesson that we have to learn and the first lesson that we have to explain to our citizens. We just decide to go together as the European Union and we have lessons to learn, taking from the, from the efforts that the UK is, is trying to do in order to, 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 to keep up his independence from the EU. And Draghi concludes that we need to work together to exercise sovereignty. And it is important for all of us. Well, let's go together and let's discuss on the topic of sovereignty of foreign investments. I come from a country which is very attractive to China. And I would like to demonstrate two or three examples concerning China's investments in my country, Greece. Starting with the, starting with the, the investments in case of Costco, acquisition of the Piros Port Authority and the container of Temelas. Costco is there. Costco is there although it has been done through a long-term concession agreement. It is well understood within Greece and in Brussels that China permanently paved its way into the European market from its strategic move to invest in Greece. And it is one of the cornerstone of Belt and Road Initiative that Sabina has already mentioned. I would like to remind everyone here that during this kind of, uh, of procedure, nobody, no European entity, business or otherwise, showed a particular interest in when the entire process began. Nobody was there. China was there. And I would like to add that this process has greatly accelerated in a very difficult economic period for my country, Greece, and it was during the time of the crisis. In the years that followed, we have some numbers that uh, we can use, and it is data showing that the influence of Pirro sport was increasing and increasing impressively. It was drastically increasing its competitiveness, ranking sixth on the year of 2018, climbing two spots from the year 2017. It is extremely important. And increasing its container throughput by double digits, 20.9%. It is, in addition, China's involvement in EU ports has stopped here, in Greece, there, in Greece. It is takes in, three, in 13 ports in Europe, including Greece, Spain, most certainly Belgium. We have a paper coming from a study by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and it demonstrates the ports that China is involving. It is about 10% of Europe's shipping container capacity I would like to put on the table for discussion. What's the lesson? The lesson we have to learn from this, from this experience. European member states, and most importantly the EU, 
we should realize that intra-European competition should not come to the expense of the European competitiveness, and even more to our economic sovereignty. I think this is the first lesson that we have to learn. You know that Greece was lacking of attractiveness for foreign business during the period of crisis, but became an opportunity for China, became an opportunity for China to drive a long-term strategy that although it may benefit the member state that it affects, it could pose a threat to the European economic sovereignty, as we can all understand. The second point that I would like to bring up to, to our discussion is coming from a conclusion of the report that we are talking about. When it comes to applying a strategy for the promotion of European economic sovereignty, we need to be careful and pay attention to all details because it's usually easy for economic measures justified on geopolitical grounds to be captured by special interest and lapse into protectionism. Protectionism is one of our threats. Furthermore, as foreign investments gives access to the entire internal market, the EU cannot regard investment as a purely national affair. And this is a very key issue. And this is my second example. It is Admier. You know Admier, allow me to, to explain you what is Admier in Greece. Admier in Greece is the independent Greek power transmission operator. It is a case similar to Piraeus Port, but Admier now is owned in part by the state grid corporation of China. And I should add here that this company all stake in power grid companies in Italy, in Portugal, whereas it had beaten bids by France and Italy to acquire the Admier stake. And the question is clear. Would we want to exclude the Chinese from the participate in the bid? Would we? Would that improve or finally reduce our competitiveness and our economic sovereignty? It is, I think, another key question. And of course, we can understand that uh, uh, Chinese state grid has a part of assets not only in Greece, in Italy, in Portugal, but also in Australia. And these management assets are fully profitable fully profitable. So, we can see that we have European networks and infrastructures influenced by China. And China is participated on key, on backbone infrastructure in our, in our continent. Another category that we can, we can discuss on, on, on this issue of, uh, of our sovereignty is the way that we can upgrade our technology and our, our influence in the world. And it is, of course, the last episode between US and China war over the 5G. 5G technologies are the key issue for this fight. And the question for me is, if finally US decide to go ahead with the protectionism, if finally US decide to close the door, if finally US decide to create a wall to, to Huawei and to 5G, maybe US finally loses from this loses in, in the sector of economics, loses in the sector of sovereignty, loses in the sector of update technology. It is one of the main issues. Well, we have to accept to, to, to put in questions maybe, to start looking for the answers. It's not easy, but I would like just to use something that Vice President Katainen has published. It, uh, it was maybe 10 days ago. It is an article concerning the way that we can maybe tackle or address some kind of challenges in, in the real world. Starting with this, by investing in sustainability, the EU now both strengthens the market economy and crabs climate change. Business models based on the circular economy are increasingly working hand in hand with profitable economy and sustainability. I cannot agree more with this. And I think that we have to choose to work on it and to have a fragment not, uh, not to have a, a fragment, but to have a, something that it is EU politics for industry, EU politics for investment. I think that we have enough, enough instruments. We have MFF to use it within EU, we have InvestEU to use it within EU, but also to use it in Africa or other, in other places in the world. But we have to become leaders. And this is the field that we have to invest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for first for having reminded us that independence and sovereignty are two different concepts. I think we all agree on that. Um, but also for the examples you, you, you've taken. I mean, the uh, the one with the the, the Piraeus uh, port um, and the notion that um, 
this investment, by this Chinese investment, you know, they, they may be nothing wrong with this particular investment, but it raises a question of what is an investment that has an EU dimension as opposed to a national uh, dimension. Uh, uh, investment, as we say in the paper, gives access to the entire uh, internal market. So there is a question uh, at, at some point of whether they are concerned about an investment. They can be EU concerned that you know, uh, are, are deemed sufficient to stop an investment which at, at national level mm -hmm. uh, would give uh, rise to a different conclusion. And that's a, that's, that's, a, that's a concern we have to address properly for which we don't have, you said we have a sort of a half an instrument, but it's half an instrument. I mean, it's not really, a, we don't have a, a capacity to, to decide. Now, you also raise a point of what is a critical infrastructure. And I think that's absolutely right. I mean, we, we need to have a proper definition of what we consider critical infrastructure. Obviously, not every infrastructure is critical. And as you said about uh, trade, you know, security can be used you know, for all purposes uh, you know, to be used without any, any sort of, of discipline. And finally, the last point you, 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 you addressed was this question of the, of the competition. And if you look at you know, some US uh, official text, the goal seems to be to ensure that the US is always ahead of China mm -hmm. with whatever mean to ensure that. And certainly it's not the European concept of saying, you know, we want to keep uh, the lead and we're going to use uh, instruments of, um, that have nothing to do with, with the proper competition for, for leadership, uh, but we're ju just going to try to stop uh, the catching up uh, 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 of China. That's mm. not our concept. So, so we have to be very careful in this respect. Pierre, your turn. Thank you very much, Jean, and thank you for also Mark and, and all the authors of the, of the paper, which I think is both very timely and very much touching on the point which will be quite decisive in asserting uh, the European Union and, and the European ambitions uh, in the next uh, five years. I think obviously it's starting from a, 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 an analysis which is obviously right, which is uh, that uh, and Andre played uh, an important uh, role in pointing to the fragmentation of, uh, of uh, Europe uh, as a, a power. Obviously it's a, a legacy of uh, of the incremental development of European competences. It is a result of uh, also uh, the view each member state has of the sovereign domain, more or less, not uh, letting also the European Commission and the European Union to uh, be too intrusive in what uh, member states uh, considered as part of the subsidiarity area. Um, and uh, all that is obviously very much uh, visible in multilateral institutions like EBRD. I see that obviously every day. Um, and uh, it's a good test of the capacity also of Europeans to articulate uh, a vision and ambition on the foreign uh, and external agenda. By the way, uh, I've been very much uh, also in the Commission and when uh, we created uh, the uh, European External Rela uh, Action Service, which is based on the idea exactly of putting more or less uh, European instrument at the service of a, a foreign agenda, which is more consistent, more coherent, and uh, that we can debate about the success Europe uh, has had in developing this approach on this instrument, but obviously um, there is a very big demand uh, from European citizens that we may collectively make progress in, uh, in uh, asserting Europe uh, with a whole range of instruments, uh, obviously in the neighborhood, in sub-Saharan <coughs> Africa, but also creating more inclusive uh, uh, obviously models of economies around us, uh, which can prevent or also some of the development which are the more or less center stage in all EU countries' domestic politics, migration, 
is one of the many examples where probably uh, compared to 10 years ago, there is a, a very strong interlinkage between external uh, development and internal or domestic development. And what Sabine mentioned about the link between internal policy, uh, policies and external policies is probably more relevant than ever in, the, in our history. Um, obviously, it's easy in this room uh, to advocate for multilateralism. Uh, we are all probably uh, great believers in that. But obviously, when we go out of Brussels and, uh, and go to member states, but also beyond, obviously, it's not a given. And Bretton Woods institutions very much questions. So we have to find new political uh, narratives which both show um, the potential costs of going back to bilateral systems. Um, and Europe itself can have this temptation, as you said, of a European nationalism, more or less thinking that we can solve all our problems on our own, that we have all the instruments to solve all the problems of uh, our problems, but also the problems of our uh, of the world. By the way, my own country is always very ambitious in solving uh, the problems of the world, rightly so. But uh, I think uh, the, the idea is obviously also um, to uh, be self-aware about the, these danger. We can only uh, be very uh, supportive of all the ideas of developing the basic uh, instruments to do that internally. You talked about innovation, competitiveness, protection of more or less strategic assets. These are very important elements. But I think we, we have to be more than defensive. We have to look at how, uh, obviously, we can build win-win coalitions with external partners, uh, bringing them more or less on our field which is more or less the, 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 the challenge. Um, we, we talked about Belt and Road Initiative. Per se, it can be a threat. It can be a huge opportunity also if uh, we bring uh, our Chinese partner on a, uh, on a field which is that of uh, obviously uh, uh, finan fiscal sustainability, uh, respect of environmental and social standards. Um, and, and that's a very important element, which is more or less pointing to the need that sovereignty is not something which is more or less uh, uh, something on its own, but we need partnership to make it happen. Partnership with China, partnership with the US. H how can we imagine, for example, in that in one area where the, the EBRD is very active, which is Middle East. Uh, we can solve all Middle East questions <laughs> without the US being embarked more or less on a collective effort. Um, EBRD is quite an interesting model, by the way, because it's European controlled uh, with a majority of European shareholder. But we have even the Chi Chinese who have 0, 0.2% of our shares. Uh, and which makes more or less the discussion possible and the engagement possible with these powers which can contribute also to the stability and the development of European neighborhood, which is very important uh, for us. The development in, of partnership is also very important for recipient countries, or what we call recipient countries, you would say in a, a little bit colonial way, but. Uh, but ownership of development strategy by, uh, by having these countries member of the same discussion is also important. Not controlling the discussion, but being, being part of also the discussion about the necess necessary reform in their model uh, of development and how this fits into a partnership uh, the EU can build with these countries. This leads me to the last issue which is tackled by the paper which is the role of uh, international uh, and European development institutions. Um, European development institutions more or less try to bring uh, to, to life sovereignty by exporting stability and avoiding importing instability from outside the European Union. Um, 
And uh, as you know, uh, in France and Germany have been started and launched this process. Now uh, there has been uh, uh, a process which uh, has been launched, which is around this wise persons group, which is chaired by Thomas Wieser, by the way, who is just uh, on <laughs> the floor <laughs> uh, <laughs> upstairs, which will be quite important. I it is about how we should devise um, a s European development system which is more coherent, which takes seriously about some of the words we are using about private sectors, how we can leverage private sector uh, uh, achieving the SDGs, but also what I talked about, how we can build partnerships while uh, with others and other powers while retaining control and probably a more sovereign, uh, obviously, influence our, on our European strategic agenda. And this uh, points, obviously, to uh, a more joined up approach in terms of policy. How can we play more or less by the ha same hand sheet when we are approaching partner countries, Morocco, Mongolia, Ukraine, using all the instruments and how more or less the different institutions can be integrated on the same agenda. But also it points uh, to uh, the need uh, of a sea which is quite a fundamental need of mobilizing other actors, and especially private sector actors, which on climate change, on all what we are talking about, is probably the, the key uh, to achieve success. This requires, and I, I wouldn't uh, underestimate that, a discussion with non-EU countries, BRD, uh, if uh, we want to have any BRD, which is probably part of this uh, ambition, it needs obviously discussing with the Americans, with others, how we can build together this win-win uh, win-win deal. And uh, I'm sure that we see with a new commission, with a new ambition in terms of projecting European influence beyond its borders, this subject will be very important when discussing right. about the real tools to make economic sovereignty something uh, in which is translated in practice. Thank you for, for raising this point, which here we, we address, but uh, not fully in the paper. To put it bluntly, I mean, there are two views. There's one view, which is that we should have 100% control of our instruments, and one view that we should have influence through partnerships. Uh, and in a way, you know, whether we should be replicating the AIB model, which is an international institution in Beijing, or whether we should go for something that's, you know, that's simple and clean, where any <laughs> European institution is 100% EU. And obviously Brexit raises the, the point, or at least makes this point even more prominent. Uh, and I think that's a strategic choice, and you alluded to the Thomas Wieser uh, work. Uh, it's an important discussion. I want to be a bit more specific in this part of the discussion. So, so let me focus on three things we're saying. One, we're saying that relates to, to, to trade, essentially. We're saying um, there is the issue of the, um, uh, the subsidies. Uh, we have a very strict state aid policy as regards domestic uh, companies. Uh, we don't have something uh, as strict as regards foreign companies. Uh, we have the WTO uh, system for, for trading goods, but we don't have that for, for services. You know, what should, be, uh, should we, we do? Should we be essentially, as we propose, using the approach that we're using domestically and, and use the same instrument, at least for making an assessment of the, um, the way in which, the degree to which competitors are subsidized uh, uh, when they operate the EU market? Second point is about uh, investment. I mentioned that before. We're saying um, on investment, uh, investment because it gives access to the entire internal market, there should be a procedure that makes it possible by qualified majority to decide that an, a certain investment is against the interest of the EU and therefore ought to be blocked even though a particular member state <coughs> sees an interest in that investment. The counterpart of it should be that you know we should be offering an alternative to this member states. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you, you can't say you know if nobody wants to buy, uh, you know, 
uh, we shouldn't set, we shouldn't keep this member state in a, in, in a limbo. So, so there needs to be uh, also an international. And the third, uh, which relates to competition, uh, we're saying on competition, uh, there, there has been, especially after the Alstom Siemens case, all sorts of discussion about having a broader approach, etc. We say we should preserve competition policy. Competition, a, a, a strict, a strong competition policy is an asset, but there are dimensions, there are non-economic dimensions in some of the competition cases. And in, in this case, there should be a voice that uh, makes a point that a particular competition case has a non-economic dimension, has a security dimension, a sovereignty dimension, and that should be the high representative who should be able to, to evoke this clause before the commission takes a decision on a competition case. So the competition commissioner would say, on competition, uh, on competition grounds, this is what I propose to the commission, and the high rep could say, certainly on competition gr grounds, but I have an objection that uh, arises from a different uh, set of consideration, and the commission would decide on that. I would like to sort of have your reaction on those three proposals. Who would like to start? <coughs> okay. Thank you. Um, this is obviously uh, the most difficult part of your paper, and <laughs> which is why I stayed away from it in my initial reaction. But you caught me out there. I think on subsidies, we need to work at two levels again. One is we have to uh, reopen the agreement on subsidies in the WTO because um, there is a limit to what you can do unilaterally. And uh, I think it was Nietzsche who said, beware when fighting monsters that you do not turn into a monster yourself. So I think in fighting extraterritorial application of law, and unilateral measures, we must not fall into the trap of uh, 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 using the same medicine uh, with the same effect. Because one thing that hasn't been said so far yet is the jury is still out on whether the US approach works, but everything we see so far reinforces the doubts that through this sort of uh, measure you can, uh, 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 you can um, either decouple China from the world economy, as some want to do, which I think is a mistake and not realistic and in nobody's interest, but it also doesn't serve the purpose of anchoring uh, China and promote more convergence between China's economic development and the rest of the world. Now, we need to do something also in terms of looking at the distortive effect of foreign subsidies on the EU market, but that is that is the, 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 the uh, scope we are looking at. Because we have to keep in mind, state aid rules apply to governments in the EU. We cannot apply state aid rules to foreign governments. But we can look at the distortive effects uh, that come from uh, uh, foreign subsidies on the internal market of the EU. That goes a certain way, but it's not a panacea either, because that doesn't address the distortions that uh, uh, come from uh, subsidies, uh, governmental subsidies on third markets. What's the instrument there? I really think that here it's the WTO. Painful and slow and difficult as it is, this is where we have to do it. And we have to start with an understanding uh, with the US, with the Japan, which we can then, in which we can then involve China before anchoring it in the WTO. Um, on the uh, uh, blockage of investment, um, it is very interesting. You have in the EU, you always have a pendulum that swings into different directions. Um, I remember, I was not working with him at the time, but I remember when uh, Michel Barnier, uh, seven or eight years ago, wanted to have an investment screening instrument, and it was totally anathema. Um, now we have one, but it is very carefully circumscribed to issues of security and uh, public order. And already, it's not even up and running, and already it's criticized as being too weak. Um, so I think we need to do this step by step. Uh, I don't mind the fact that at the moment it's half an instrument, because the expertise for assessing many of these things are also at the level of member states. We need to work with the member states in assessing uh, uh, these investments, and as I said, it is not the EU policy to, to decouple anyone from the world economy. Uh, 
China's lack of convergence with the rest of the world in terms of its economic model poses a problem, uh, but uh, we are not in the business of decoupling, and China is an important market, and it's an important investor, and uh, uh, we will have to continue uh, uh, to work together. So, um, I'm also, uh, I mean, the, 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 the idea is interesting, I'm not, I think it is worth exploring, uh, this idea of blocking investments with QMV, but I have, uh, I'm already, uh, uh, I'm already fearing the massive lobbying that will weigh on individual member states by people who want to organize a, a blocking minority. Uh, that will not be a, a, a nice view to, to behold. Now, um, so fortunately you put this, you put your three points in the order of increasing difficulty for me. Uh, it's the last one I have the biggest difficulties with. Um, especially if this debate is informed by uh, uh, um, Alstom Siemens. Um, I mean, I don't think I think, I think we need to look at the link between um, competition on the European market and global competitiveness. But I'm deeply convinced that it is not by restricting competition on the internal market that we actually strengthen uh, our companies globally. And if you look at uh, uh, the rail market, which is the one we are looking at here, isn't the real problem the lack of an internal market in that area? Isn't that what holds back companies? I really don't think that uh, uh, it's all about creating European champions. Um, and uh, if you look at the mobilization of a lot of companies and member states in the Siemens Alstom case, and uh, 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 a lot of people intervening saying, don't authorize this because it cr uh, creates uh, 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 positions of, of possible abuse of market power in my market and in the internal market, I think these things need to be taken seriously as well. So there is an issue to look at, but um, I'm, I don't think that you can solve it with an institutional fix like a sort of a veto for the high rep. Uh, I'm also not quite sure because I think also in the paper you only talk about the high rep blocking a merger which would be authorized by the competition commissioner, or by the commission on the proposal of the, of the uh, competition commissioner. Would you also consider doing this the other way around? I.e. the high rep saying for, you know, um, reasons of uh, uh, foreign policy or whatever, we have to authorize uh, uh, this merger even if the competition uh, concerns are very serious. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, uh, and this opens up a whole new can of worms, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm, I don't think it's an easy fix to the issues we face. This being said, I do recognize, and I think that is also what the uh, commission will do, the incoming commission, they will look at, do we have the right definitions in competition policy? Uh, are the ways we define the relevant markets, are they adapted to the realities of today? But I think this idea of juxtaposing foreign policy and, uh, and competition policy risks being to the detriment of both. Just thank you. Thank you for very being very clear. Uh, just to be clear also, I don't think we address explicitly the Alstom Siemens case, but we, each of us, I think, each yeah. of the author separately, you know, uh, express his, his or her view uh, on that, and, and they're, they're very, very clear. I mean, we, we do not consider that uh, our proposal applied to, to it. Uh, I mean, clearly we are very much in favor of, as, as you said, a strong competition and uh, that um, um, our proposal is precisely meant to be contrary to the idea that the response to those problems is to soften the, the, the competition policy and to, you know, to give more weight to the interests of the producers in general, which is the position of some uh, voices. Uh, not to be too precise. <laughs> 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 well, uh, the, the, I mean the, the, the Altmaier proposal and the Le Maire uh, <laughs> statements. Well, very, very briefly from my side. Uh, first of all, I fully agree with Sabine. 
the, the level that we have to discuss about the, the, global, uh, the global subsidies and all of this is World Trade Organization. And we have to start uh, discussing with our partners in order to create a level playing field. It's not easy, but it is, it is needed, it is quite important. It is quite important to understand that a lot of uh, international companies are now receiving uh, subsidies in, uh, in various forms. And we have to take it into account and start the discussion as an entity, as a EU, first with the US and China, maybe at the same time. It is extremely critical for our businesses. Second, it is, it is the, the infrastructures and the investments. It is the case that uh, I have already mentioned in my first introduction. I think that uh, before starting discussing about how we can we prevent the the influence of China or Russia or someone else in, in the e EU area, we have to discuss how can we, can we bridge the gap of investments that we face as member states and as the EU as an entity. And allow me to, to, to use an example coming also from Greece, we <coughs> need more than 100 billion of investments for the next five years in order to overcome the, the consequences of the crisis. So we need for direct foreign investments. And we don't want someone to stop it. We need someone to screen it, to understand the, the, the crucial position that the investments and the infrastructures are having in my country. That's why it is important to have not a specific fund, but to have the instruments and the additionality in the within EU in order to, to bridge the gap. We can use everything that we can blend. We can use money coming from from our multi-annual financial framework, we can use money coming from BRD, we can use money coming from InvestEU, we can, we can leverage, we can elaborate uh, in the private sector, but we have to have enough funding in order to have investments in our member states. And the third one is the, the security reasons that we can raise for, for the competition and for the, for the issues that we face in, in our, in our uh, legislative system and in our decision-making procedure. I fully disagree with the, the, the to, to give the competence on, the, on the, our high representative. It is important for all of us to have a level paid field uh, with, the, uh, with the companies. It is important to, to, to to leverage the, the issues with member states, but it is, it is quite difficult for all of us to have an EU coming from Brussels, an EU decision coming from Brussels to put security reasons for such, uh, for such issues. It is, it is, I think, one of the, of the issues that it will create a lot of concerns in the member states and a lot of concerns in companies as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, before I give the floor to Mark. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you, Jean. Uh, Obviously, BRD cannot be uh, can be uh, uh, suspected from not liking market. <laughs> it's like a little bit like GG competition or GG trade. Or <laughs> uh, we are we have been created not only to develop market but to sustain the development of market economy. So uh, I think uh, I would share very much uh, what Sabine said. Um, at the same time. We are very much confronted to the realities of countries outside Europe where uh, different models, uh, Chinese companies, state-owned enterprises, or part of, of, of Chinese system is uh, more or less competing with institutions which were built on Western standards or European standards in terms of environmental social standards. So I think it, it, it questions also the capacity to build positively, as you mentioned, a European capacity to, of institution to be more agile, quicker, because when I meet uh, any prime minister in the Western Balkans, they are saying more or less, in my lifetime, I want this road to be built or I want this investment to be done. And the Chinese uh, are proposing uh, me to do this in two years. EIB, VRD, the Commission, you know, <laughs> this crowd is proposing me to do it over 10 years, uh, reforming everything <laughs> I mean the country. So this is a question about how we can be more agile, how we can be more efficient, and how we can create the positive elements at the European level uh, to be in the, this competition in, in a more 
uh, in a more relevant way. By the way, Greece is a good example because uh, the, the mandate of EBRD has been expanded just after the crisis to, to Greece where we invested uh, uh, more than a quarter of billion e euros very quickly in all the systemic banks. But, uh, but, but, but I think we should have these kind of reflections, more or less integrated reflection, more, much more systematically. And that goes to the point, we can debate about the, the last proposal of having a veto power or, or, or not of the high representative on ground of security issues. But I think it points also to the capacity of the, uh, of the European system to work less in silos and integrate different dimensions uh, in its decision-making process. And you can do that uh, in competition through uh, a, a revisited approach to what relevant market means. But at least to have, to admit that public decision is and has to be grounded on a plurality of arguments which are economic, social, strategic, is something to become a power <laughs> which is uh, fundamental. So uh, I would say, in a way, to take into account this uh, dimension is, uh, is, uh, is very important while not making, uh, creating more distortion. And I think on the development side, we have a system which creates distortion outside Europe, which uh, doesn't encourage private sector to develop. We are uh, subsidizing, in a way, compared to the market, uh, uh, a lot of these markets in Morocco, in Ukraine, in, in countries where our system, uh, being very generous and backed by the taxpayer, European taxpayer money, doesn't look at how sustainable the development models we are exporting to these countries uh, are. And that's one of the, the question is what the right, uh, what is the right uh, model of uh, development uh, strategy uh, we want to export to these countries um, that requires more or less a whole analysis about what market means, what pricing of our operation there means, and, and that's quite fundamental uh, to have a consensus, a European consensus on that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a very good discussion and it shows how difficult these issues are and that's something we were grappling with as well. We didn't actually all agree on everything at the beginning of the process, but I think what we came up with in terms of our recommendations was an attempt to try and answer the Nietzsche question, how okay. not to become monsters, how to be clear about the world that we want to live in, but also not to be open to manipulation by others who fundamentally don't share our idea of what kind of world we want to live in. and. The institutional response that we developed is is based on trying to do that, how to uh, uh, on a realism about what's actually going to happen in the current institutions, how they frame their norms. Personally, one of the things I I fed in when we were debating it was was a very early experience just after we set up the European Council on Foreign Relations, when Russia. Um, decided to introduce a, a blockade of Georgian wine. And I went to see Peter Mandelson. And I said to him, uh, can we do anything to help the Georgians? Um, because, you know, th they needed to find a new market. This is a way of stopping, of, sh of showing solidarity with the Russians. I said, I'm very worried there might be a war in Georgia. This is 2007. And there was a war a year later. And he said, I, I, we can't do anything at all. It's, um, uh, I can't, I've only got 500 staff who are trade negotiators it would be crazy to divert their attention to, to work on the Georgian market. It's tiny, they should be talking to the Chinese, to big markets. We have important trade deals to do. And he said, there's absolutely no way I could justify doing anything at all. And we didn't, you know, it wasn't, that, it wasn't a monocausal thing, but it was something quite simple that we could have done at relatively low cost to ourselves. But it was clear that within the logic of, of DG trade, that was not going to be a priority and wasn't going to be a good use of resources. And I, I think that trying to import these different security criteria or other things into into the into the commission into competition policy and it is going to lead to those kinds of it will either get lost or it will have a distorting effect so the question is can you create different mechanisms so that those voices can be heard and taken seriously and ultimately not 
undermine the, the, the Commission's independence from the member states in areas where it has, um, where we've decided to pool our sovereignty, but at the same time to, to make sure that um, member states through the Council have a chance to sort of engage with these things. And, and that, that's the sort of difficult compromises which we were trying to do. But I, I think that, you know, there are other ways of doing it. I'm not sure that, that this is the only way of, of, of trying to do that. But I think it, it struck, struck us that that was a more promising thing than having false expectations about being able to get these sort of security concerns fully integrated. And if you look at the US, they also have different institutions and different ways of feeding things in. And CFIUS is a, is a very good example of, of trying to do exactly that. And what we tried to do was to come up with something which was sensitive to the unique constructions which we developed within the EU. Okay, let's uh, open the floor. Uh, we have about 20 minutes. Uh, I see two, three uh, here, Philip. Alicia and Rainier Day. Philip Steinberg. Yeah, Philip Steinberg from the German Economic uh, Ministry. Actually, um, I'm a little bit surprised that uh, this panel discusses um, this notion of economic sovereignty enhancing European sovereignty um, like very uncritically. I mean, I would like to put it into, into question a little bit if enhancing the economic sovereignty is a goal uh, by itself. I mean, I would frame it a little bit different, and I think it's not an academic, academic exercise, but it's, it's, it's highly relevant uh, for practical terms. I would, I would start coming from a um, problem-oriented uh, oriented approach. Of course, we do see changing geopolitical problems, and of course we have uh, other challenges like digitalization and so on. And of course Europe needs to respond to that. But then we actually analy analyze the problem and not actually formulate a goal like economic sovereignty. Because then actually it becomes a goal in itself. And I don't think that's the way forward if you talk about economics. I mean, we, we are proclaiming, and Cecilia Malmström was just doing it there, we are talking about free trade. We are still talking about the virtues of division of labor, of international value chains, and, and so on. And I still do believe in that, and I think we all do believe in that. And therefore, it's a bit difficult, you know, to be, to be so general, uh, even though, of course, I acknowledge the attempt, actually, to be, to be, to be very uh, specific. But um, I think because we, we then, th there's another aspect, and that is many of those instruments we talked about, they come at a price. And we need to actually talk about the price as well. And most, most obvious is, of course, if you talk about the international procurement instrument, and there we talk about increasing prices or even banning some tenders, some offers, and that will um, re result in less welfare, potentially, for, for the customers. So I think we should talk about that. And therefore, let's come from, from, a, from, an, uh, from a, an approach, let's, let's adopt an approach, actually, which is uh, problem-oriented. I think, uh, even though I, I acknowledge, of course, that economic sovereignty, it's, it's a good term, it sounds, it sounds fancy, but, uh, but I still would be a little bit reluctant to use it. And one last word on, on of course, competition policy, because I'm responsible for uh, competition policy as well in Germany. Um, I mean, that, that's one of the examples. So where do you stop, actually, then, if you talk about sovereignty? I believe that the German, French, Polish proposal now I was a little bit involved with, now they're they are sensitive, actually they don't, uh, don't have uh, the negative effects uh, Sabine Weyand actually um, um, uh, was, was afraid of. Still, I mean, this is a very good example that we need to talk about the problem and not enhancing economic sovereignty in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alicia, I guess you're here already. Thanks. So first of all, thank you for a wonderful panel. Uh, I'm going to start right there. Uh, um, I think all of this makes sense if we believe, and I do believe, that we're losing economic sovereignty. That's why we're discussing measures that might not have been there before, because we might not have needed them. So now that, and, and I, I claim that we are losing economic sovereignty and that we need those measures, what surprises me is really to hear that basically we only have trade. I mean that in the next five years, there's nothing else that I should be expecting as a European. You know, that really frightens me, frightens me uh, enormously. And, and any other measure that has been uh, proposed by Jean, 
would look too aggressive or say, you know, I, I just heard that going beyond uh, state aid, beyond European member states is not possible. I mean, I'd like to know why it isn't possible <laughs> as a European citizen. Why isn't it possible? Because I heard, uh, and I'm very happy to, to, to know that, you know, State Grid and Costco have very profitable businesses in Europe that we Europeans didn't want to uh, invest in. But I also like to know why they're so profitable. Do we know why they're so profitable? What's the role of subsidies in, in that profitability? Do we really know enough to, to even make that statement? So, so basically, my, my point here is I do believe we're less economic, <laughs> economically sovereign in Europe, given what's happening in the world, and I don't see enough measures out there to, to tackle this issue. Yeah, I had a question on your third proposal, uh, Jean. So, um, in case so DigiComp will analyze the case based on what maximizes the surplus for EU consumers here, um, and then you have you, you give the authority to the high representative uh, to come up with any considerations that would involve any sovereignty. But if there is a conflict between the two, how is this going to be resolved? Will this be just a discussion uh, by the Commission and a based on the political uh, constitution at that stage here? Or will there be also some kind of rules uh, identified how to trade off these two dimensions here, which could be particularly important also not to create too much uncertainty for, for the business environment in terms of which outcomes of decisions will actually be taken uh, here? Should we perhaps start with you because there was a question directed to... <laughs> well, first of all, I would like to make a, a short, a short uh, comment concerning sovereignty. I think that it's not only the economical dimension, it is also the dimension concerning our security. And it is important to get involved in this. It is important to, to secure, first of all, our borders. At this time that we are here discussing in Brussels, in Greece, we face an enormous uh, uh, migration crisis once again. It is, I think, the biggest one since the common declaration between uh, uh, EU and Turkey, the joint statement. So it is important to secure our borders with supporting our new, our new uh, EU guards corp. It is important to support Frontex, the existing Frontex, with more funding and more equipment. It is important to start having a policy on secure our borders. Secondly, it is, I think, important to have much more active industrial policy. And th this is my, my short answer to your question concerning the profitability of, uh, of China state grid, etc. Of course, they receive various, in various forms, state aid. And we have to consider this and we have to tackle this because, as Sabine said, uh, the, the state aid rule is is implied is implied only on member states and not on the other on the other governments and not on, on the companies that uh, we have here in the European Union. And third, we have to consider about developing a fully fledged security policy in the future. And I mean a fully fledged, as a part of NATO, of course, as a shop in a shop, we have to consider it this. But it is a part of our sovereignty, and we have to discuss it as well. Thank you. On the competition point, I mean, our idea was A, that we'd lay out some very specific and clear criteria on which grounds this could be exercised by the high rep, and then ultimately it would be a, de a decision for the college. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that um, they would do it with uh, Europe's best interests at heart. Um, but I, th I think that seems to be the only way that you could actually aggregate the, the two unless you would go to the council, but then that undermines the whole, that then I think you do walk into the Nietzsche trap. Um, to our friend from the German finance ministry, I mean, <laughs> sorry, economics ministry, sorry. Um, I mean, we, you know, I think there are, there are lots of different, there are lots of very different um, and very specific problems that we're trying to engage with, but 
there is clearly uh, a growing set of, of problems that we're dealing with. The, the free trade ones that you're talking about, the state subsidies we've been talking about. Um, you know, what will happen if we are forced to, 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 to swallow poison pill clauses in trade deals like the, 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 on China as happened to NAFTA if we do do a deal with the, well, I don't know if we'll be forced to do it, but there, I'm sure there'll be an attempt to try and get us to, to, to sign up to those sorts of things. So there are proliferating examples of other powers trying to force things on us which are not necessarily in line with our interests and our values. And even though we have the largest <laughs> Um, single market in the world and uh, very functional uh, institutions, we're finding it increasingly difficult to, to push back on it and to make choices. And I think 5G is a very good example of something where member states are being put under enormous pressure and haven't really worked out a way of either thinking about it and, and um, actually ha preserving the policy space to make decisions. Which, which are in their interest. And if we look forward at the development of AI and new norms and standards around that and the whole, so there's both a sort of narrow defensive agenda, but there is also a technological revolution which is going on with all sorts of norms being worked out in different areas. And if we're not able to, to have a voice in that, then I, you know, we could miss out on, a, on an enormous set of economic opportunities which our citizens and our companies will, will regret for a long period of time. Let me compliment and then give the floor back to, to the other panelists. Um, I mean, we started from the observation that China and the US, each uh, in its own way, does not separate uh, uh, the economic sphere from the geopolitical sphere. So that's, that's what they have in common. Now, obviously, it's very different uh, because um, in, in China, it's much more, uh, you know, companies uh, being, in a way, the instrument of state power, whereas in the US, it's the other way around. Yeah. I mean, it's a state power <laughs> through the control, of, through the weaponization of markets, let's put it this way. Um, uh, actually, implicitly in this discussion, we address much more the China concern than the US concern, but they, I mean, they are in, in our paper, we, we, we're sort of keeping a balance. We, we're saying that the use of the centrality of the U.S. financial system and the U.S. dollar to impose U.S. preferences is a major concern yeah. and something that is, is a threat to our sovereignty we should react to. So, mm -hmm. so you know, we're having a sort of particular di dis discussion. Now, what our aim has been uh, to, to sort of find ways, uh, find organized ways, for find procedural ways, find principled ways to deal with those issues. Uh, not to say uh, those issues do not exist, but to say we want to preserve the, the rule-based order, the rule-based economic order. Uh, but we, 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 we think that to preserve it implies taking on board some other consideration that cannot be ignored, but to take them on board in a, in a, in a way that avoids the economic principle being overwhelmed uh, by other consideration or, or at, at, at worst, uh, being distorted for economic reasons, taking as an excuse uh, security or sovereignty consideration. That's the aim of, of, of the paper. Now, you can criticize this or that particular aspect, but I think the philosophy is clear in this respect. Thank you. I'm, I'm not coming back to the philosophy. I had already explained at the beginning of my remarks that you, know, you can turn this in different directions and it can indeed uh, foster misunderstanding. So it's good to unpack it, uh, which I think you do in the paper. But I also would say that the catchy title of economic sovereignty got you more attention than uh, if you had, you know, had a lengthy academic paper title. So uh, <laughs> I wouldn't criticize you for that. Now, I wanted to come back to this issue of um, uh, we only have trade. Uh, that's because you have me sitting here. Uh, if you had, uh, you know, uh, the director general for GROW or for, uh, for, for RTD or I don't know what sitting here, we would have had more input from the other side. This being said, I was very specific. Economic sovereignty starts at home. That means we have to create the basis for our internal policies. Uh, and that means that it's the whole challenge of what do we do on innovation? What do we do on artificial intelligence? Uh, uh, how do we regulate uh, the, digital, uh, uh, the digital single market? How do we regulate uh, 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 data flows, etc.? Those are the big challenges, and that is where the future of Europe will be decided. 
uh, trade is then the projection of what happens internally on the out on the outer world. But it's not trade that the trade policy that that can uh, uh, solve uh, these uh, these problems. Why can we not apply uh, our state aid rules uh, 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 outside the EU? What I try to explain is that state aid is ba is a concept where you put restrictions on governments inside the EU. That's the way, it's not, state aid control is not a control on business, it's on control on member states. That's the way it works internally. So we cannot, and that's where the Nietzsche element comes in, we cannot fall into the trap of extraterritorially trying to apply our state aid rules to foreign governments. What I did say though is we need a different type of instrument where, which can be inspired by uh, some of the content of our state aid rules, but which would be disciplines on investors in the EU. And basically, th this means, and you would have to apply it to uh, 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 domestic EU investors as well as foreign investors, you would have to apply a discipline or a prohibition or whatever of foreign subsidies. So it's a totally different concept. I'm not saying you can't do anything about it, but it's not simply applying state aid extraterritorially. It's more complicated than that. Last remark I wanted to make is actually on what Mark explained on, um, on the way you thought this uh, sort of high rep check on competition decisions would work. The thing we need to keep in mind is, and I was reassured because I had really understood you as wanting to vest that power in one single person. And I think that is a heavy responsibility to carry. Um, but I'm very concerned about the fact competition policy is subject to strict judicial review. And sometimes the court reverses decisions that the commission has taken. How do you do that if you change the process and all of a sudden you have these political considerations coming in which do not lend themselves to, to uh, judicial review? So I think you risk, uh, we really have to make sure that the solution to the problem you have identified is not worse than the problem. Uh, so I, I remain very reserved on, on, on that sort of idea. Um. I think, first, I would dispute probably quite strongly the idea that uh, the concept of sovereignty is irrelevant or shouldn't be uh, discussed because I think it's very much linked to democracy. At the end of the day, uh, sovereignty is a principle, by, by the way, which uh, more, more or less uh, has been the basis of uh, of democracy and parliament, parliamentary democracies. So we can't say that sovereignty is an ir irrelevant uh, concept because it's only about being able to have in your hands and to influence our destiny. So is it at a national level uh, or European level? I think it makes more sense on many of the subjects we are talking about at the European level than the, at the national level. And that's why I think uh, the, the subject is extremely relevant also uh, to, to be able to explain to European voters why should they vote for uh, people in the European Parliament, how, <laughs> because if they have no power and have no influence on uh, also how uh, their, their future is shaped, uh, obviously no, no one will be interested in in what's happening in, in, in this town and, and beyond. So I think this is important. I, I, I'm not sure that it's a, a goal in itself, but also when we look uh, at also the way other approach, and I think uh, you focus on, on, on China and the US, but we could also ha develop other examples of powers uh, which are entering this game. Uh, the question of level playing field is obviously an important issue um, and we, we cannot uh, close our eyes on, on these realities. So I, I, I think this, uh, and I have no problem <laughs> uh, in, in thinking that this idea of economic sovereignty at the European le level, despite uh, the fact that you can put different uh, borders to this concept, uh, e e but I think the paper is very clear about that. The fact that it's only trade, obviously it's not only trade, and I think uh, 
um, the paper mentions all the dimension of the, uh, uh, of the issue, innovation, I mentioned rapidly, but I think on development, uh, this is one dimension, and my experience is uh, when you go to see the Ukrainian prime minister with having two, three, five, ten different voices, obviously you under, uh, you, 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 you undermine the influence of Europe and, by the way, uh, of the European uh, uh, system to wait in, in the, in, in, uh, beyond our borders. So I think this sovereignty means also having clearer and more consistent objectives and capacity to implement them uh, inside the EU. Thank you. I'll take a last quick question over there. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Samuel de Verves from the European Neighbor Council. We deal with foreign policy in the neighborhood. So not China nor the United States, but indirectly. Um, I have a few questions. Um, I just wanted few, to ask... Just one. <laughs> just one, okay. <laughs> I will ask individually afterwards then. I wanted to ask about the, um, the European investment screening uh, idea. Presumably this will be blocked by some countries uh, in the EU, like Greece or Hungary or other countries. And um, so it would be quite difficult to, to even imagine that happening in the first place. So have you given any thought about, uh, especially this question would go to Mark because it's in his paper, uh, and uh, whether uh, there are any ways to do that, um, uh, practically and technically. And then also, small uh, put together question, whether you've also given thought to how uh, citizens uh, would be able to maybe incentivize politicians and officials more in, in this uh, quest for, uh, for uh, your economic sovereignty. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mark? Um, I think that um, Jean hinted at, I think, w what could make this more possible, which is the idea of, of having the screening and some sort of compensation package. And one of the things that struck me a lot over the last couple of years has been going to Greece and to Portugal where there's been a lot of criticism from other member states about um, certain investments uh, but at the same time less of an understanding of the fact, the fact that we were the ones who were forcing the governments to privatise uh, these institutions because of other decisions that we take in the different bits of the EU system and there weren't any European alternatives. And I think it's absolutely intolerable on the one hand to insist that governments divest themselves of, of, uh, of, of institutions in order to meet budget rules um, and then cr criticize them for, for, doing, for selling it to, to China if there's no other alternative. So I think we do have to have a, a kind of bigger picture. And if you, if you do it in that spirit, then maybe some of the, the, the fears which other member states, have, which particular member states have, 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 have used about these things being um, uh, politicized and instrumentalized against them might, uh, might disappear. Um, on citizens, um, beyond the sort of normal demographic, democratic process, we haven't really gone into that, but it's an interesting idea. Okay, apologies to all of you who wanted to, to raise questions. Unfortunately, that's not a discussion that's going to go away, uh, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, so there will be, there might be, there will be other opportunities to, to, to continue the discussion. And, and, and really, I mean, you know, th this, this is a sort of first try to, to put issues on the table and to try to discuss them in an organized way. And, you know, there's a lot of progress to make. Um, both in terms of, of concept, in terms of scope, uh, and in terms of the, uh, the clarity and the feasibility of the proposals. Thank you, and thanks to all the panelists. Thank you.